Okay. I don't even have to bang the gravel or anything. And my mic is green? Wow. I mean, I didn't have to do anything this morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I just, I just said to somebody, yesterday at this time, I was um, shoveling the car out and taking all the snow off of it, the four or five inches we had. And today, uh, I didn't have to even have a coat on. <laughs> Welcome to Weather in the Adirondack. Um, before we get started, I just uh, I have something of rather a somber uh, uh, matter to, to um, share with you, and, and that is uh, what happened about a half a world away uh, yesterday in, in New Zealand, and um, where 49 people were killed by a, a terrorist, um, and it was clearly a hate crime, uh, and uh, and uh, I think all our hearts go out to, and, and best wishes go out to all of them. It's just, uh, 49 died, and I think there are many more in critical condition, and it's just, um, I just cried when I saw it on the news last night. So uh, I wish them well, and, and um, it's gonna take a lot of time to get through this, but, um, but our thoughts and prayers are with them too, so. Anyway, all right. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> Leave that to you um, as we move on. You're next, so. Um, do you want to do advice of counsel first? Or oh not? yeah, you know that's. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So, yes. So um, before we get started this morning, uh, uh, we had a uh, an executive session, and I just want to report to you on on what was discussed. Um, uh, we met to discuss two current cases that are in litigation. The first is uh, by Protect the Adirondacks. It's their appeal of the trial court decision upholding snowmobile trail construction. And the second uh, lawsuit is uh, one by Adirondack Wild and Protect the Adirondacks. It's their appeal of the third department's appellate decision upholding the Essex Chain UMP. Uh, they were discussed and no action was taken. So that was the extent of our executive session. With that, um, we will start Economic Affairs Committee. Art. Great. Good morning. I'd like to call the Economic Affairs Committee to order. And I am pleased to have Dan here presenting. We don't get this luxury too often. And, uh, but I will give a little infomercial that I think Dan has been a very active part of our agency by going out into the park and talking about how we can help local businesses and how we're, we are, as our sign says, we're open for business. And with that, good morning. Good morning. All right, we're working here. Um, so we have a very exciting presentation today. Um, so I'll be pretty brief in my, in my report. Um, one thing that's kind of a new initiative that's emerging that, that people might be excited about is um, there's kind of been uh, the, the beginning formations of a work group addressing age-friendly communities and age-friendly recreation in the park. Um, that's been led by Mercy Care for the Adirondacks in coordination with DEC staff. Um, so we met in January down in, in Warrensburg at DEC's office to look at how we really frame this work group, but we've invited them to come speak at local government day. So. Um, Greg Olson, who's the executive director for the New York State Office of the Aging, as well as Paul Beyer, who is um, Department of State's director for Smart Growth, will both, both be presenting on age-friendly communities. And so hopefully from those conversations, we'll, uh, we'll advance the work group, and, and we have some other stuff on the way um, that I can't quite uh, mention publicly yet. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then, Art, you teed me up for, uh, for the public outreach component of this. We are always trying to get out in front of as many groups as possible. Um, next week, we're in front of the Warren County Chamber of Chambers, so all the chambers of commerce in Warren County get together monthly. Um, so we'll be presenting to them. We're going to the town of Dannemora the following week, and then after that, we're in the town of Hadley. So we're trying to get in front of different groups as well as town boards and, and really push the story that the Adirondack Park uh, is open for business, as, as we'll hopefully uh, learn more about today. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce Garrett Kopp, who's the founder of Birch Boys Chaga. Um, he'll come up in a second. And today with him, he has Loretta Burkle and Josh McLean, who are both uh, intimate members of his team. So uh, with that, I introduce uh, Garrett Kopp. He has a very cool website with all his story and blogs, so it's a highly recommend checking that out as well. So thank you guys very much. All 
right, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah. So uh, let me begin by just saying thank you. Uh, this is a really awesome opportunity. Uh, it was a huge surprise when I saw it in my inbox. So, um, you know, I've had a lot of awesome opportunities to present, but normally there's some sort of pressure or goal attached. And, uh, you know, we're kind of going into this blind. Um, so this is really fun and a little bit more cathartic. Uh, my name is Garrett Kopp also known as the Chaga guy or the Mushroom Man. <laughs> I studied at Clarkson University. I studied innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and I studied that for three years. And I ultimately ended up leaving Clarkson, you know, despite having a tremendous education, uh, I was just very ready to get into my career. I also skipped my senior year of high school to go to Clarkson a year early. So uh, I just like to do things quickly. Um, with that said, I guess I'll just get into it. So I wanted to start by telling you guys our mission. At Birch Boys, our mission is to empower everyday people through the abundance of nature, wellness, and love that the Adirondack Mountains have to offer. Now, that's a little bit more broad than mushrooms or chaga. So uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But you know, to fully understand our mission and my mission, uh, you have to learn a little bit about my story. I was born and raised in Tupper Lake, New York. Uh, my family came to the Adirondacks when my grandfather moved here from the Bronx uh, to study at Paul Smith College. And he fell in love with the region so much that he ended up writing a book about Tupper Lake. Uh, he was the head of the Chamber of Commerce. And you know, additionally, he was one of the first three people at that time that was uh, meeting uh, to talk about the Wild Center. So uh, he's always been really involved in the community. And in a, in a strange sense, I've always felt like, you know, uh, like I can't ever leave. Like this is you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, my grandmother, though, is actually who taught me about Chaga. So when I was 15 years old, I used to mow lawns uh, to make extra cash. And I did this for my grandmother. And I went inside after mowing her lawn to get something to drink, because um, I was very thirsty. And I found this big jug of what I thought was tea in her refrigerator. And I just thought it was any other iced tea. I poured myself a cup of it. You know, I drank it, and I still thought it was just like any other iced tea. And she came in, and when she saw what I was drinking, her eyes lit up, and she told me about the story of the king of herbs, um, or chaga. She told me it did all these great things, that indigenous people have been using it for you know, thousands of years. She even took me into her backyard and showed me exactly where she picked it. And I was really just infatuated with her erratic kind of enthusiasm. And, you know, for whatever reason, I couldn't take my eyes off of it. And I've always been an outdoorsman, so I just started seeing it in the woods, you know, all over the place. It was like I had never heard of it before, and then all of a sudden I couldn't stop finding it. I was dr when I was driving, when I got my license, I was always looking in the trees to the point where it was dangerous, uh, <laughs> searching for chaga. So ultimately, my grandmother and I ended up getting the idea to take chaga to farmer's markets, we had collected so much of it, we didn't really know what to do with it. And she used to knit uh, scarves, pot holders, mittens, and do that stuff anyway at vendor events. She would sell those. So she snuck me into the Wild Center, and that's when I you know, had my first farmer's market selling chaga. And after that day, you know, I never mowed lawns again. I made $300 in about five hours. And People were really inspired by it. People had read about it. It just kind of, you know, that's, that day started it all. To give you guys a little bit more insight into what we actually sell, um, you know, if you look at the bottom left of the screen, we'll start with our tea bags. That black box in the corner is our signature product. I debuted that um, in March of 2017. And uh, we ended up getting it on the shelves of 150 stores by the end of 2017. Uh, we came out with a maple chaga tea shortly after. 
Uh, it just kind of curbs that earthy flavor of the chaga a little bit. And then this year we even came out with a wild reishi and rose hips tea. And reishi is another mushroom that grows wild here in the Adirondacks. We also have chaga lotion, um, loose chaga tea, and then in the top right you'll see these four bottles called tinctures. If you're unfamiliar with a tincture, it's a more potent and condensed extracted version of the mushroom and it has a little dropper. You add it to any beverage throughout the day, smoothies, um, just five to ten drops. So one of the things that you wanted to hear about was our business model and I've always found the business model canvas you know to be one of the most useful tools to articulate this um, so I'm gonna kinda walk you through each one of uh, you know one of those uh, categories the first is key partners and you'll probably notice I'm gonna start to answer some of the other questions you know that you had going into this through some of this uh, Point Positive is an angel investor group that we work with. Uh, Molpus Woodland Group is um, you know, a land owning company where we basically lease 220,000 acres of land within the Adirondack Park from them for exclusive mushroom harvesting rights. Um, so that's really where we source our chaga from. We also work with a variety of loggers, people who work for logging companies and are getting it from private land. And we have an independent agreement with each person that harvests it for us if it is not us ourselves going and harvesting it. You'll see River Valley Distribution, Cavalero Foods, and Garden Spot Foods. Uh, that's all kind of under the same umbrella company of River Valley Distribution. They service Wegmans and Price Chopper. And uh, we have a distribution agreement with them. We're in Price Chopper right now in Market 32, uh, hoping to be in Wegmans soon. Black Magic Alchemy uh, is a company that sells chaga root beer. We actually are the exclusive supplier of raw mushrooms to Black Magic Alchemy. So we work with a lot of other businesses that use chaga uh, or other mushrooms as a raw material. Um, but you know we have the capacity to source it. The Wild Center, I worked there um, and we do a lot of mushroom workshops there. Of course Clarkson University uh, is my my university. They're going to be helping us set up a lab for some testing on chaga and they actually own a small percent of my business. Um, Paul Smith College, we want to work with them in the future particularly in our sourcing and finding trained foresters so that we can you know fully move that to be an internal process that we can fully oversee and manage. Uh, the last one is Adirondack Fragrance and Flavor Farm in Parrishville and they help us make our skincare products. I apologize if you can't see the fine text but I'm just gonna summarize it anyway. Our key resources really are the mushrooms that we sell. Uh, the first is chaga. Chaga contains more antioxidants than any naturally occurring food that's ever been tested uh, with an ORAC score. So that's pretty impressive. Um, it also contains polysaccharides, which give you an energy boost, but there's no caffeine in chaga. It helps your body convert food into usable energy, and that's the role of the polysaccharides. So chaga is kind of like the superhero mushroom. After you drink it, it kind of makes you feel like you want to start organizing your closet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rishi is a little bit different. It shares a lot of the antioxidant benefits and uh, anti-inflammatory benefits of chaga. It also grows wild here in the Adirondacks. But it has a much more relaxing and calming effect. It's an adaptogen. Uh, it's you know, really good for stress or anxiety, honestly. We recommend, you know, the Birch Boys motto is we drink chaga by day and reishi by night. <laughs> then we also have lion's mane and turkey tail that we sell in the tinctures. Uh, we grow these mushrooms. We don't actually harvest these mushrooms wild. Um, and to sum up their benefits, 
Lion's Mane is a nootropic, which means it helps with uh, cognitive functions. It actually, in several studies, has been shown to help repair the myelin sheath on damaged nerve cells. And by the way, it is MS Awareness Month, so um, you know, Lion's Mane is a product that people are finding very promising right now um, in those regards. Turkey tail, um, really the, the main benefit of turkey tail is uh, alleviation of pain and uh, in inflammation. I figured for the key activities, it might be more fun to just let you guys see what a day in our life looks like. Do you need sound with that? Um, it would certainly be beneficial, <laughs> but it doesn't need to. Thank you. I think you guys get the point. It's going to the customer. Um, but you know, another key activity that you probably don't see here is uh, we do a lot of digital marketing, and that's kind of reflected in the order going out. Um, especially this time of year, all of our business, uh, for the most part, is online. Oh. So, what is our value proposition? Uh, the first is that we, you know, are selling wild mushrooms. Uh, there's companies that grow chaga and reishi on artificial substrates, and the product doesn't really reflect the same benefits of wild mushrooms. Um, and you know, real knowledge. My point with that is there's a million dollar question out there, and that is how much of this stuff is there in the world, in the Adirondacks, whatever you want to ask. And the truth is that nobody really knows. Nobody's really collected any data or research on that. And we have a tremendous opportunity to do that. Um, and I think that you know, if you have the truth and the answers, then you know, you're setting yourself up for success in the long term. Uh, so that's what I mean by that. Um, and we want to work with Paul Smith and Clarkson University to do some of that. Uh, and the other thing is not only are we the only major mushroom company in this industry that sources the mushrooms in the United States and to have you know everything our, our whole process is vertical integration in the sense that we're harvesting the mushrooms we're producing it in-house you know everything is direct to consumer um, and but you know let alone the United States uh, we're doing it in the Adirondacks so um, that's really our value proposition Customer relationships, uh, we try to be transparent, traceable, direct, and personal. Uh, we're really making an effort to reconfigure our sales channels and our marketing as well um, to be direct to consumer. And uh, you know, we, will to, we need to make sure that we educate people with our product. Um, and you know, we'll get more into what I mean by direct uh, communication and relationships with consumers, but that's what we're pursuing. 
So these are our basic sales channels. Uh, of course, our website at birchboys.com. Bulk mushroom supply, like I mentioned with Black Magic Alchemy, we supply mushrooms to a variety of companies in bulk. Uh, we sell on Amazon, although uh, we're probably not going to continue that relationship, um, you know, following the theme of direct to customers um, and bringing everything in our control. Uh, we have a physical retail presence, our store. We are relocating right now and we're reopening in May, but um, I'll talk more about that adventure in a little bit. And then of course we sell to grocery stores. So we have a distributor, we're pursuing Wegmans right now, we're in Price Chopper, we're in Kinney Drugs, and we're in 150 independent health food stores or grocery stores. <coughs> Our supply sources, uh, like I said, we work with Molpus Woodland Group. This is uh, a visual of the actual land that we have uh, secured for harvesting rights. Um, and you can see right about here is Tupper Lake. So it's all very central to us. Now I wanna take a minute to talk about the harvesting techniques themselves. The most important thing to point out uh, is, you know, we're harvesting chaga and reishi wild. Reishi's harvesting season is in the summer. Chaga's harvesting season uh, occurs during winter. Reishi and chaga are very different in the sense that reishi will grow for about a month and a half, it will drop its spores, and then it will die and rot. Whereas chaga, for years and years, just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And if there's any confusion, chaga is on the right, reishi is on the left. So the reishi, you know, to maximize the sustainability of your harvesting, it's very simple. You just have to wait until the mushroom drops its spores. And uh, it's very visible because there's a very orange rusty powder that will kind of coat everything below it. And I actually have a piece of reishi with me. You can see kind of that dust that I'm referring to um, in the crevices and things from the mushroom that was above it that dropped its spores. And this is closely related to the artist conch, which is white reishi, which people draw on. You may have seen that. Um, and then this is chaga. You know, chaga is actually a parasite to birch trees. You can see that even just this small piece of chaga has pretty much eaten a hole throughout the tree. And you can see the whole ring of the ring of death, I guess, where the chaga is living on the inside of the tree. It starts on the inside and works its way out. Um, what I found with chaga, just based on my own experience doing this for years, is it's very important to first, you know, not dig into the tree at all when you're harvesting the chaga, because then you're not doing the chaga or the tree a favor. But if you leave like two to four inches of the chaga behind on the tree, or roughly 15%, it will regrow to uh, a comparable size in two to four years. Yeah, so, you know, that kind of raises the question, you know, w I wanna figure out where you can maximize, you know, the lifespan of the tree and also the volume of chaga that you can get. Um, so, but you know, at the end of the day, no one has really even tried to answer these questions. If they have offered answers, they're just lying. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because it feels almost like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking of the word, but it's uh, undiscovered territory. The last frontier, that's what I was referring to. So a little bit about our future plans. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen that building on the right in Tupper Lake, the Ginsburg building. Uh, we are currently headquarters, our headquarters is in the bottom of that building and we're working with the Adirondack store. They're gonna be opening their second store in Tupper Lake on the main showroom level of the Ginsburg building. And we're actually going to have uh, a tea bar within that store um, right there on the side of the street. So we're at the other end of Park Street from where we were last year, uh, but we're incredibly excited. You know, We're working on it every day and we'll be opening on Memorial Day weekend this year. So I guess at this point, I wanted to 
open it up to questions. I also wanted to invite Loretta, our administrative manager at Birch Boys, and Josh, our quality control manager here, so that if you have any more specific questions that maybe are suited towards them, they uh, can get a chance as well. All right, go ahead. Okay, anyone have any questions, curiosities? Bob, you want to open it up? Is chaga limited to what kind of birch? All kind, what kind of birches does it grow on? Most, most often you'll see it on bigger birch trees, which just so happens to be yellow birch trees most of the time, but it does grow on every type of birch tree. Uh, you know, white birch trees you'll find it on, but even, you know, the more unique birch species. But the bigger the tree, the better the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it takes a lot to sustain the life of chaga, you know. For, uh, we would never har even harvest a piece like this because you can't even really do it without damaging the tree. So to get those really big pieces, I mean, some of these pieces would make, you know, 4,000 tea bags. It's not like you're picking regular mushrooms, and that requires a bigger tree. And, uh, you know, one other thing I wanted to mention, under future plans, it says branching beyond mushrooms. I didn't address that, but, you know, and th this relates back to our mission statement. Um, one of the things that we want to do this year is in our product development, you know, move beyond mushrooms. Uh, one of our plans is potentially to do uh, some sort of pine needle tea because pine needles have five times as much vitamin C as orange juice. Um, and it's actually pretty good. Um, we also want to do a pine pollen tincture uh, potentially with CBD. And, you know, that will mark a really important expansion for us. Karen? A couple of questions. Um, you started to mention about the effect on, on the birch trees. Does it eventually kill the tree or? Yeah, it will eventually kill the tree. And I think what happens is this kind of hollow part that you see will just get bigger and bigger. And normally it ends up snapping or breaking right around where the chaga is. Yeah. But at the end of chaga's life as well, when it actually produces spores, it's a very unique thing. Um, Throughout a huge section of the vertical length of the tree, the bark will just kind of split open and reveal this weird kind of porous, uh, you know, silvery section of the tree that normally would not exist, um, and it kind of oozes out uh, this weird goo, which has spores. And another question, uh, are you working with scientists or doctors or experts to determine what the, the potent, what, what the health benefits are? I mean, because you, I know you mentioned studies, what kind of studies you're doing? I mean, how do you, how do you come up with your final product that you know that it's safe and, and the consumer is getting the benefits that you claim that they're getting? Yeah, absolutely. I'll let Josh answer the question about the safety. Um, but. You know, one of the most interesting things I observed getting into chaga and learning all about it was that there's a pretty incredible abundance of research on the actual health benefits of chaga. Um, a lot of it comes out of Russia uh, after the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown. Um, and that seemed to kind of kickstart a lot of research on it. A lot of people, you know, had chaga growing in their backyards in Russia. And, um, you know, there's one link that takes you to over 340 uh, scientific journals and case studies. The antioxidants are measured just through standard ORAC scores. Um, and, you know, what's, what's amazing to me is seeing all this information and evidence, and, you know, if you Google it even on your own, uh, it's impressive, but absolutely none on the life cycle or, you know, that I think is important. Thank you. Uh, we're very big on when the product comes in, we're inspecting it, making sure there's no impurities, anything like that. We also do send out some of our product to get independently tested every now and then just to make sure we know what we're getting is what we're getting. Um, I, that's with Clarkson and uh, Paul Smith, so I would love to team up with them so we have lab backing from them. There are lots of unanswered questions that we do want to team up with them to try and get some answers to. Because there's no regulation, right? I mean, are you regulated by, by anybody? We are, we, 
We fall under uh, the jurisdiction of Department of Agriculture and Markets. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as long as we don't advertise this as if it can fight, treat, cure, prevent any diseases or illnesses, then, you know, that's pretty much where we stay. Because essentially we're raw materials processing. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, typically there's a certificate of analysis, which is a standard lab report on acceptable levels of certain things like E. coli or yeast or mold or heavy metals in a product. But there just isn't any point of reference for chaga or rishi. Um, you know, you can't even find a single one. So we have this unique opportunity to kind of set the parameters and, you know, everything that we're trying to do is bring it internal and emerge as the authority. Bob. I was just wondering about the supply constraint, and I understand you have 240,000 acres to go on, but it, are, you, are you reaching capacity? Are you going to have to branch out? How, do, how does it look to you? You know, uh, this is the most, you know, this is how I've done my math and kind of wrapped my head around it. When I was younger, my family leased 800 acres of land, and, uh, you know, I used to spend a lot of time on it. I ended up pulling about 800 pounds of chaga from it um, when I was in my farmer's market days. And I, I did, you know, I knew the entire land pretty much like the back of my hand. And I operate on the assumption now that there's approximately one pound per acre of land um, of chaga. You know, if you're looking at a, a very large piece of land in the Adirondacks, of course it varies because you'll have so many acres with none, but where you will have chaga, it doesn't grow in one pound. It grows in much more. So, you know, with that math, I assume that in, you know, four years' time, uh, start, if you harvested everything in one year, by the time you allowed some regrowth, that, you know, you could potentially pull 400,000 pounds of chaga off of that property. Ultimately, we'll have to see, you know, we just got the uh, lease for this land in um, last summer. So uh, we, we went through a move this winter, so we haven't really thoroughly gotten to scout at all. So you're, you've got a lease with a timber company whose business is growing timber for value. And does harvesting chava slow down the decay of the log, as you've pointed out here? Does that, when you harvest it, does that, does that slow, slow it down? Uh, as, and that would be, of course, interesting to the owner of the timber who's trying to grow timber. I'm just curious if, if that slows it down. You know, I would love to believe that, and it'd be a great marketing uh, thing, too. But uh, truthfully, we're not really sure. You know. Okay. And then the second question, is: you said, the bigger the tree, the better it becomes um, for chaga growth, right? Um, I'm sorry, Loretta also studied oh. mycology at Paul Smith, so I'm going to give her an opportunity. Just briefly, yeah. um, uh, foresters probably are interested in birch trees that are infected with chaga because it affects the veneer quality, potentially. That, that's exactly my point. And so do, does the does Mopus, for example, look at you as providing a service that helps enhance the quality of their logs that they eventually harvest? And then the other question that's coincident with that is, as the tree gets bigger, that log is gonna, that tree is going to become more valuable and more attractive for Mulpas to take it down. Uh, so there goes your chaga for that tree. And, and is that dynamic worked into your relationship? And yeah, yeah. So I mean, with the first part of that, truthfully, I don't know if there's been that much thought put into it in terms of you know whether this is a threat to their trees um, or do, you know if they're trying to get rid of this stuff. Um, I don't really think they thought much about it until, you know, I made this proposal. Um, but what I have noticed is that loggers can very clearly identify a birch tree with chaga on it and recognize, you know, that lumber is not valuable. And so, I mean, I found um, just in my initial uh, scouting of pieces of the property, places where there had been logging that had occurred. And, right in the middle of it is a beautiful birch tree with a piece of chaga on it. So in, in a way, that has done me a service. Um, but, you know, it's still going to be very important that the chaga is able to reproduce um, and, you know, find new host trees. So 
Um, and I think they understand that, you know. Can I ask why not commercially produce your own chaga? Um, some of these species are pretty easy to reproduce. Um, why not have a chaga bush, you know, take a low grade stand and inoculate it? Um, it? It would seem like it's a pretty direct way of going about it and pretty efficient. Why not consider that? You seem to be only wanting wild chaga, and I and I get sort of the the mysticism of it all. But isn't it possible to commercially produce it? So I mean, the what, why I'm so adamant about wild chaga um, is that obviously the health benefits are much better. But you know, specific things like there's a compound that's specific to birch trees called betulin, and a lot of the research that has occurred, um, especially that came out of Russia, um, they they did tests, and I'm not making no claims, but they did tests that found that the betulin in chaga could trigger apoptotic death in cancer cells of mice that they were performing the tests on. So, um, you know, unless it's coming from a birch tree, uh, you're probably not going to get that compound. Uh, but then, you know, that does raise the question: Can you inoculate, you know? live birch trees and I have attempted to do that as well uh, unsuccessfully um, I think though if there is any way to commercially produce it I think that's probably the right way to look at it because it takes 10 years you know for this to really um, grow and it it's it for years drains all the beneficial minerals and compounds that the tree is taking in like kind of rides off of its hard work so um, you know, it'd have to be something really spectacular in order to replicate the benefits. Um, and I'm not ruling it out by any means. But, you know, a lot of people that try our product, um, you know, they're doing research and they're very concerned about their own health for one reason or another. And, um, you know, it just wouldn't sit right with me if I, you know, wasn't giving them the quality. And I do think someone is going to have to do some research on Chaga's life cycle if we want to be confident in the future that, you know, this is going to be a sustainable resource that will be here to stay. Just to tell you a side story, um, I use turkey tails at some times. I'll take a piece of birch um, or maple or whatever and inoculate it, um, just a chunk of it, three or four feet long, bury it in some... Uh, wood chips in, in the woods and a year or two later I'll go dig it up and I'm a wood turner. What happens is those things infect that, go down it and through their chemical processes of, of breaking down all the various components of wood, it, it leaves behind a stain. And so wood turners use it because it stains the wood and you come up with these unbelievable pictures that are created by nature. And, and I'm wondering if you could find a similar thing if you were to find when these trees are cut down, is that stain going down through there? Turkey tails works great. It grows very easily. Interestingly, I've never eaten it. I just use it to create this artwork, uh, which may be heretical for a forestry professor to admit that he, he inoculates fungus into trees when her, we would used to throw all that away or burn it or whatever. Now we're finding that it's a, nature is pretty amazing, as you are discovering. And you may find uh, artists who, who find what you're working with uh, has a secondary use. Just, just a wild story. Yeah, I, quick little story off of that. I had a wooden woven mushroom foraging basket, and I had turkey tail in it, and I left it there. Um, and, and it started growing and, you know, on the wood in the basket um, very quickly, too. So... Uh, yeah, and as far as the art goes, I definitely want to introduce piece, you know, artwork in this store. And, you know, it's going to be a great fit with the type of artwork that the Adirondack store has as well. And that will probably be our, you know, our test to see if, if it's viable for us. I'm, I'm the small business guy wondering, you, successful businesses always have an entrepreneur like yourself, but is... Who's the one who keeps you grounded that the business plan stays on track? Is that Loretta? <laughs> you know, truthfully, um, you know, I have to do it to myself. 
but I, I, I've always said that I uh, pursue my very right-brained goals and ideas, you know, with very left-brain tactics. And I am very strategic. Um, I don't know, I guess they might have some insight. Uh, <laughs> but I, I find myself, you know, doing that a lot. And, you know, even if that means, like, you know, literally just yelling at yourself, okay, this is not, you know, worth your time, this is stupid, um, even if it's fun or what you want to do, you, you just have to do that sometimes, you know, because I keenly understand, uh, you know, what happens when I'm not focused on my goals. And I've gone through, you know, failing enough times in some way or another that's reminded me that. Well, we're totally enthralled with this. It, this was really cool. And thank you so much for taking the time to come talk to us and talk about how you can live, breathe, and work in the park. Great job. Thank you very much. All right, don't go anywhere. We have a little, a little something for you. So uh, why don't you grab some of the chaga and some of the mushrooms? We'll put them all in a photo. How's that sound? <laughs>
You ready? Yeah. Okay, we're going to keep going. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So, Art, you want to finish up your committee? Adjourned. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go on without Terry. <laughs> right, so with that, that concludes all the committee business. So uh, we're going to go back into full agency. Uh, and um, we're La Sarah. Okay, Dan, you ready? Why don't we start with with your report? Uh, regulatory programs. Do you want me to wait? Or? I don't know. Right. We should, don't you? Might not be a bad idea. Sorry. All right, just give him a minute. Yeah. Okay. Okay, regulatory programs committee did meet. Uh, we approved the uh, February draft committee minutes. We heard an update on the delegation authority from Paul Van Cott. And we heard project P2007 11 RX, which is a third renewal uh, for construction of a single family dwelling on a lot created by a subdivision involving wetlands. Um, the project was approved with conditions by committee, and I moved to the full board. Uh, as rec with a recommended resolution that our chair has uh, for a vote. Okay, are you moving it? I'll move it. Okay, uh, can I have a second? Mr. Thomas is a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And what about that delegation authority? Um, did you, you, I think you had a, uh, you had uh, um, approved a motion recommending the proposal to the agency board that we amend the Del Res? Right. Okay. So I uh, need a motion then um, to, to uh, recommend this proposal, well, it's been recommended, but to, uh, to authorize a proposed amendment to the Del Res. Right. We have a, a motion by John Ernst. Second. Second by uh, Chad Dawson. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So that passes. And what we've done is, just so we're clear, is that um, this is, um, we, are, we are authorizing a uh, proposed amendment to the Del Res. Okay? All right. Anything else, Dan? That concludes the business of regulatory programs. Great. Thank you. All right. Next, uh, State Land, John. Thank you. Uh, we met, we approved uh, committee minute, minute, minutes from uh, the February meeting. Uh, we heard a planning committee report from Rick Weber. Uh, and we um, heard a presentation by Corey McGee of DEC on a Hammond Pond Wild Forest uh, UMP. Uh, and we uh, propose to you, we recommend uh, for action, authorization to proceed to public comment uh, on uh, master plan conformance uh, for this final UMP. Okay. So I guess we're, that's the motion. Okay. Are you making the motion? I'll make the motion. Okay, may I have a second? We have a second, Bob. Thank Bob. you. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It is passed unanimously. That's what we had. Okay, great. Thank you, John. But then? Next, Park Ecology. <laughs> <laughs> Here I come again. Um, we uh, met. We approved uh, committee minute, uh, minutes for a February meeting. Uh, <coughs> Kathy Regan gave the uh, RAS report. Um, and we had what I thought was a 
really very interesting, uh, comprehensive um, report on Lake George salt reduction by Chris Nowitzki, who's a Lake George waterkeeper, in terms of the, the effects of salt uh, in, in so many different ways and the very imaginative ways that they have uh, worked out within Lake George to mitigate it and to form a model that could potentially be used by other municipalities and working with Department of Transportation. So that's we have no mo no motions, no actions. That's it. Great, thank you, John. No minutes, no minutes. We did, we did do that. Okay, you approved those. Okay, great. Okay, good. All right, I think that's it on uh, committee reports. So let's go no. to in. Oh, oh my God! <laughs> Econ you are here. I apologize. I'm just trying to rush things ahead that's too quickly. Right. Go ahead, Art. Right. It's just because. and has created a business in, in the park using Adirondack products. And we were uh, delighted with his presentation. Then that was it. That's the end of our report. Great, thank, thank you. you. Sorry to leave Don't you out. Problem. How could I forget you? Okay, now we're on to interim reports. Uh, administration, we did, uh, we did not meet and we have no minutes. Uh, enforcement. Enforcement has no minutes. No, we had a report, but um, that's it. Okay. Legal affairs. Same. Dan, local government. Did not meet, but uh, reminder: local government day is April third and fourth. Okay. Uh, park policy and planning chat. No meeting minutes, and we have nothing to Thank you. Public awareness and communication, Mr. Thomas. Hey, no minutes. Okay. Is there any old business? Is there any new business? Okay. Uh, all right, then we're going to go to a public comment. Uh, I see there is one person who would like to speak. Uh, oh, two, okay. Mr. Barwick. The only thing I ask is just that um, we try to limit this to about three to five minutes, if you would don't mind. I will try. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. My name is Floyd Barwig. My wife Susan and I are summer residents of Eagle Lake. We live in a, an off-grid cabin on the north shore of the lake. In the winters we live in Post and Kill, New York, a stone's throw from where Bob Stegeman used to live. <laughs> Obviously my concern here is about the Hammond Pond Wild Forest UMP. I have some subjects that I'd like to address to you, not as criticism of what has been done, but for some ideas for you to consider going forward with your work. They concern public notice, the specificity and transparency of the report, consistency of your actions, and some common sense. I intend these to be constructive criticisms. Please take them that way. On public notice, for background, I'm the retired director of the Office of Energy Efficiency and the Environment for the New York State Department of Public Service. In that role, I was responsible for construction, maintenance, and vegetation management on 17,000 miles of transmission lines in New York State and Lord knows how many miles of pipelines. The processes there inform how I think about things. When the New York State Independent System Operator would prepare a report on the transmission needs for New York State, they would do exactly as you have done. Public notice, post it online, hold a couple public hearings, accept comments. However, before any action is taken, there is a second step. Everyone who is impacted is notified. If we're going to clear trees on a right-of-way, the expectation is that the contractor will notify every single person along that right-of-way. 
If they're going to tear down a set of poles and put in a new set of poles, there may be a proceeding with administrative law judges and all the rest of it. I don't expect you to do that. But I would suggest that you could afford to have a staff member spend a couple days finding out the names of the people on a lake that is going to be seriously impacted and notify them. And if that's too much work, I think you could have someone spend a half an hour and find the name of the association on that lake and notify the president and ask them to pass it along. I did not see those steps done. And I think it's part of the conflict that's sensed in this proceeding around Eagle Lake. Moving on to specificity and transparency. When I got the document and I went through it, I got to the section that said response to comments. To me, that means this is the response to all the comments you got. I looked in there and I found my comments aren't in there. There's a couple sections of my comments. I don't know why those sections and not others. I think some of the others were equally relevant. I know there are other people who wrote and said some what I would consider important things. They're not in there. It doesn't say response to selected, response to edited, response to our favorite comments. It says response to comments. There's no first paragraph that says we select things. I found out yesterday from this podium that you select some things and leave out others. I don't know why. There's no paragraph that says we do this selectively for the following reasons. We choose subjects that we think are of relevance, subjects we think are important, subjects that are our favorites. I think you could be more clear on another issue. In the discussion of changing the boat launch to a fishing and water access point, the discussion says that there will be a barrier constructed at the water's edge and a roller structure that will allow an average person to, without much difficulty, bring a typical boat into the water. There's no picture of this structure. There are no line drawings. There's no CAD drawing. There's no perspective drawing. There's no definition of a typical boat. In my comments, I define a typical boat on Eagle Lake. It is our 1986 15-foot Boston Whaler with a 70-horse motor on the back, and it weighs 1,000 pounds. I want to see your structure where I can, by myself, launch that boat. So I went online, and I went to see what does one of these structures look like. And I found a picture of the installation that was done, I gather, a year or two ago at Garnet Lake. Two short vertical posts, a horizontal bar that appears to be a steel pipe or steel tube, about a foot off the ground. It's a wheel stop. It's not at the water's edge. There's seven to eight feet of dirt beyond that wheel stop to the water. There's no roller structure. There's a wheel stop. When I read it, not having been involved in your discussions, what are you thinking? I think you're deceiving me. I think you're telling me you're going to do one thing, but when I look at what you've done, you've done something else. I think it's going to be a lot more difficult to launch a boat than you said. If you were more clear, I think we could eliminate this. It, when we're not being clear, we're shoveling fog. If you would be more clear, then I can respond more clearly. Oh, you're talking about what I think your boat is. It's a lost pond boat carrying one paddle, one fishing pole, a ham sandwich, and a six pack of beer. I don't think that's the typical boat on Eagle Lake. If you would be more clear, then we could really have a conversation. Sue and I are representing no one but ourselves. There's a lot of other people who would like to talk with you too. And I think if it would be more clear, everyone could have a better conversation. My next point is consistency. We had a discussion here where it was mentioned yesterday that lakes under 1,000 acres don't deserve a boat launch. 
You don't have any analysis to support that. That is a number pulled out of the air. If you go to the Eagle Lake boat launch and go five miles to the east, you will find yourself at the Paradox Lake campsite. It has a boat launch. Paradox Lake is 880 acres. But if you look at a map or a satellite picture, you will see it is not a big 880-acre lake. It is two 400-acre lakes joined by a channel. It is two Eagle Lakes joined by a channel. Those 400-acre lakes get a boat launch. Eagle Lake, you've got to think about that for four more years. If you go the other way to the east and turn south, you will find yourself at the DEC campsite on Putnam Pond. They have a very nice boat launch there. It is used by fishermen, and Sue and I have done the loon count on that lake for some time, and you see many people out with their fishing boats, bass boats, other boats, puddling around fishing. Putnam Pond is 185 acres. I believe that is below 1,000. When you don't see consistency and you're on my end, the receiving end of your report, you're tempted to think of hypocrisy, certainly inconsistency. I would encourage you to look at Eagle Lake with a little more consistency. It's twice the size of Putnam Pond. The use of a lake is determined by the intensity of its use, not by its acreage. My final comments are on common sense. On Eagle Lake, there's a campsite at one end of the lake, and there's a boat launch at the other. They don't meet your definitional requirements on your maps to be intensive use areas, and in this report, they're dealt with as separate items. For a century, people have launched their boat at the boat launch paddled their way, motored their way, fished their way up the lake, under the causeway, to the beach. On our lake, it's not known as a DEC camp sign. It's called the beach because it's the only decent sand beach on the entire lake. So people go there, they spend the day, they fish their way back, or they stay a few days and they fish their way back. They are joined and they should be dealt with as joined. That would be common sense. And then, when you see the Putnam Pond campsite and boat launch, they go together. The Paradox Lake campsite and boat launch go together. The Eagle Lake boat launch and campsite go together. What is a more Adirondack experience than to put your boat in the water and go camping? but your definitional procedures don't allow you to see that way. Take off the bureaucratic blinders, pardon my expression. Take them off and look at this in the real world with common sense, they are together. And there is a hundred years of use behind this. Circling back on the public notice, Think about it, what it's like on our end. Ordinary citizen, I'm no longer a state bureaucrat following your activities day to day. I know your agency's names. An obscure report comes along, and on page 78, it takes our world and stands it on its head. Ms. Bart, if I may, if you can just... I am thank going you. to wrap up right thank now. You. Thank you. If you could be a little more direct, and contacting the people who are impacted, we would gladly engage with you if you would be a little more clear in what you are proposing to do, we would better understand you. If you would be more consistent so we could see that you're coming from some rational direction, then we would stand ready to help you with the common sense part. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Thank you very much for your comments. Ron, did I see your hand up? Hmm. It's 
So uh, my name is Ron Conowitz. I'm with the Adirondack Powder Skier Association. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Karen and to uh, Terry and Kevin and Tate and Rick, uh, Commissioner Sagos, Bob Stegman, Tom Martin, all the folks at the governor's office uh, for trying to move this uh, cross-country ski trail guidance along. Uh, it's been a long time. And uh, I, we appreciate the fact that uh, everyone's looking at the comment letters and trying to uh, come up with some uh, answers to, uh, to move this document forward. It's been in progress for at least five years. Um, so I wanted to give you a little snapshot. I went up to do Wright Peak on Wednesday with Mike Lynch from the Antarctic Explorer. Mike is a uh, writer for different publications. Now he's working for the Explorer. He was actually going to do a video of me skiing the Wright Peak Ski Trail and also skiing the hiking trail, the shared part, and take some still shots uh, for an article that's going to come out, um, hopefully, uh, once the guidelines are approved. Um, so we showed up, and uh, there were... It was a Wednesday. It snowed about 14 inches between Monday and Wednesday. Uh, prime conditions, um, there were about 25 uh, backcountry skiers uh, coming out of Adirondack Lodge. That day, there were probably about 50 hikers. Uh, the lodge was certainly not full. Uh, that access is many different places. And, and people were looking for different experiences. Like, we were going to do the Wright Peak Ski Trail. Some people were going to uh, ski the Mount Cold and Trap Dyke, uh, which is more of a mountaineering experience. Other people were going to ski Marcy. Some people were going to ski the Cold and Coolar. Some people were going up uh, um, Algonquin. Uh, so people were, you know, kind of spread out. So the solitude was definitely there. Um, we ran into about 10 snowshoers uh, going up Algonquin or coming down. Uh, during the day, and we thanked them for wearing their snowshoes. Uh, we got up on the ski trail. Mike took some amazing footage uh, skiing down the ski trail. It was just incredible. Um, when we got to the hiking trail section, there were these footprints in the snow, and uh, they were not super deep. They were probably maybe six or seven inches deep, and uh, Mike had gone ahead to video. You know, we were taking our time. He'd go ahead and get ready sh to shoot some a section, and I would come down. And as I got onto the hiking trail, suddenly I started to accelerate because of the holes in the trail. And they weren't super deep. I wasn't going to go in them. But just uh, because the bottoms of your skis are no longer touching the snow, uh, and there were three sets of footprints, I was accelerating, and then there was, you know, it was narrower. But I was able to get into the powder on the side, but it was this constant, like, fast, slow, fast, slow. And uh, I quickly got a little out of control. And as I got close to Mike, I actually had to duck off the trail underneath a tree uh, to, to just bail. I, d I just found myself bailing out. And I've been skiing the mountains for a long time. I've skied all the 46 peaks. I consider myself a pretty good skier. Uh, and so that's just an example of how that impacted our experience. And there was just three people walking up. Um, when I was, later on, I was at the lodge uh, putting my skis into my truck. Mike had left. and. Uh, these three guys come out of the woods, and, and I said, hey, where you guys, where did you get to today? They said, we went up Algonquin. And uh, they were three cadets from West Point, uh, freshmen, on their spring break. Uh, one guy had sneakers on and sweatpants. Uh, they had one pack among three of them. Uh, they were 18, 19 years old. I thanked them for their service and said, jeepers, you guys really, you know, it did impact our skiing, but from a safety standpoint, going up Algonquin this time of year with no equipment uh, is pretty dangerous. And so we had a nice exchange, and uh, I, I thanked them for their service, and they were heading up to Montreal for their next night of their spring break. But just to give you an idea of what's out there, you know, what's actually happening in the high peaks on a Wednesday in mid-March, uh, great skiing conditions, but, you know, the shared trail thing sounds great, and whether it be mountain bikes or fat bikes or hikers, the purpose-built ski trails really do make a difference. Like the experience that Mike and I had along with the other, uh, there were four other skiers, uh, three skiers from Vermont, uh, young college students, or they were graduates in their late 20s that are working in an adaptive ski program at Smuggler's Notch that had never skied in the Adirondacks, came over because they had heard about the Wright Peak Ski Trail. And then there was a guy from Saratoga that came down. Uh, everyone was kind of looking for fresh powder. Um, it was an amazing day. Uh, and uh, just those three people, those three cadets, kind of ruined it for Mike and I for a lot of that hiking trail section. And that was just three people with sneakers on. Um, and so you, it, it, it does make a difference. 
uh, in that you know people have talked about in their comments uh -huh. about shared mountain bike trails, and, and it sounds great, but when does mountain bike season end? You know, there's that shoulder season. When does fat bike start? You know, and, and it does impact your skiing experience when you're coming down in, in, and going up uh, because the holes prevent your, your skins from climbing. I um, wanted to give you that snapshot, and then I wanted to talk briefly about uh, some of the comments that folks had concerning uh, wilderness areas versus uh, wild forest areas. And uh, the people that we saw the other day were doing different objectives. Some people were doing the whale's tail, which is a little bit easier. Some people were going into Marcy Dam. Some were going to Lake Colden. Uh, varying conditions, you know. Uh, some of the comments said we should only be aspiring to experts on these trails, which sounds great in theory. Uh, but what about the people with, with families or that want to do something milder? Does that mean that they should not be allowed to be on uh, wilderness areas? Um, I, I'm not so sure about that. You know, we do have lean-tos. We do have hiking trails. We do have uh, lots of facilities to make easier hikes. Do we say, oh, we're not going to allow hiking on snowy anymore because it's too short and it's too easy and it's in a wilderness area? You know, uh, I think that we can accommodate a variety of people, and people are looking for different things uh, when they go into the wilderness areas. And uh, we certainly had a, a great day. Uh, it was wonderful up there. Uh, we saw probably 15 people all day, 10 people. Uh, we only saw uh, three people on the actual ski trail section. Um, you know, one of the comments was, let's not make these trails too easy for people. And, and I know the person that made that comment on the Antarctic Almanac, and he's a great skier. He actually uh, tried out for the U.S. ski team. Uh, I used to ski with him in the 80s. The trails were a little bit wider back then. Um, and it's great that, that he would like to see these trails not get any wider. And it's true, you, there's a 1,000 miles of hiking trails that you can ski, but they're really not set up. Um, and so I, I, I made some suggestions the other day about we're all for uh, having some uh, alternatives as far as uh, how do you manage wilderness trails versus wild forest trails. One of the things we talked about was uh, slope uh, percentage, maybe going up to 15%. Right now it says 10%, which is about 6 degrees. 15% is about 8.5 degrees. 20% uh, goes up to almost 11 degrees. Um, I'm over my time. Yeah, but if you can just conclude. I'll look sure, point. okay. Um, and then, you know, as far as uh, swaths up the mountain sides, I think that uh, utilizing natural openings, we certainly don't want to cut trees any more than anyone else does. Our original proposals were for open wood ski routes where we'd cut no trees. And by utilizing naturally open areas, and by uh, avoiding sensitive areas, uh, we can do this in a wilderness area and, and have it make sense, uh, have it be more of a wilderness experience than a hiking trail is, and, and they are. Uh, so I, I want to thank you for your time, uh, and, and I hope that you'll include us with any of the red line changes that you might make. Um, we're hopeful that this document will, will move forward, um, and uh, that when we get all done, it'll, it'll be a, a practical uh, document that, that is a world-class document, not only for protection, but also for user experience. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Okay, uh, moving on. Jerry, local government. Okay. So, once again, I'll thank you for your comments. Yes, yes, I'm not in the once again, I'll thank you for your comments. And it brings again, once again, to light the uh, friction between people who bound state land and and like to use state land and uh, uh, and the process we use to classify and uh, manage our state lands. Um, I've said it before to many people. Um, I think in the past there was a rush to buy state land. We end up with things like DeBar Lodge that was non-conforming and probably should never have been purchased. We end up with parcels that end up blocking in access. 
Um, and as was pointed out, we sometimes end up with inconsistencies with how it's managed just because there may have been something non-conforming there that we have left because that's what the decision was. Um, I'm not sure of all the facts or how you as a board need to address it. I know this comes out of a DEC plan, so therefore, you know, you guys are only open to public comment at this time. It's not your plan, it's DEC's plan. Uh, but in the future, I really think we as a state of New York need to target our purchases better. We need to understand what historic uses are on them. We need to know what infrastructure is on them. And quite truthfully, if there's non-conforming uses, do we really need to own those non-conforming uses to tear them down or destroy them or destroy the history and the culture of the Adirondacks just because the state of New York wants to own more land? Uh, the time has come in my mind that we have to be much more targeted in how the state purchases land and moves forward and at least be a little more cognizant of how it impacts the culture of the region when we do start buying land and closing off traditional ways of recreation. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, we are on to member comment. No comment. No comment. All right. Um, I'll just comment on I had the pleasure of going to a place called Zeefeld, Austria, which is near Innsbruck, and I observed in a high mountain plateau uh, in a, a new, I don't know, form of, I never dreamed that people would love to cross country ski on complete flat areas. I always thought cross country skiers loved varying terrain and hills and valleys and woods and and the success of this particular region in in Austria was because you had the majesty of the mountains shooting up from this high mountain plateau but you had 230 groomed kilometers of ski ski on complete flat and it just was sobering for me. I just never thought that there was a demand for that. And then I realized that um, it's probably now maybe one of the top three attractions for cross-country skiers in the world because of the fact that little children can go with their parents. And um, I was able to go with my dad, who's 84, and and we had a pleasurable hour and a half ski together. Um, and, and I just was like, wow, and we didn't need hills for excitement or whatever. But then when he suggested that my sisters and I go off and let, cause he'd done enough of a loop, he could loop back while we went farther. Um, he loved to tell me about how the elderly Austrians uh, delighted in passing the old American and uh, and so um, but it but it just it shows to me that you know we have areas in a, and I'm leading toward the rail corridor as a perfect example of a completely flat terrain that really has the potential to be uh, I think a year-round attraction and I'm anticipating the use of that soon. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Mr. Ernst? I just want to say the, I thought, uh, as usual, the, the special presentations really add something to these meetings. I mean, always to hear a young entrepreneur like Everett, uh, Garrett, rather, talking is, um, you know, there, there are others out there, too, that some of them, whom we've heard, but it, it's a great feeling. Uh, it, you know, it, it's a sense of what can happen in this park and the new fires that are being generated. 
And uh, Chris Novisky's pre I mean, environmental presentation, which uh, you know has new thinking, new research, new ways of looking at things. I mean, it's great for us to, to hear that. Thank you, John. I thought it was a really good meeting, and I think it was a, because of the content, but I also think it was a good meeting because of the decisions we reached. And I want to, I don't want to necessarily respond directly to the comments we heard, but I appreciate the comments we had. But I just want to put some things in context. Um, one of our jobs at DEC and here is to follow the law, and our, our decisions have to fall within that bound. I think much of what we did with, with uh, Hammond Pond uh, was, a, was a, a test to see how we manage that. Um, we can do the big change and make, make the whole area a way less classified area. Maybe, it's, maybe there's differences of opinion about what it should be classified, but nonetheless, it's classified, and we have some rules to follow. Um, I also appreciate the comments about process. Um, you know, we do have requirements about how we notify, uh, and we follow those. Um, it's a big job to tell everybody what's going on, and it's sometimes maybe not done as well as we could be. But I think we did try, did our honest best to try and let the word out. Now, having said that, I think at the end of the day, the results are what measure what happened, despite the process. And I think when it was learned of the concerns that were had, uh, and there's a little bit of surprise by the uh, the lack of, of awareness of the process that had taken place, uh, there was, uh, I would call, not a bureaucratic response. I would say there was a very active response that sought to find uh, a resolution to concerns that were within, within the uh, bounds of law and the requirements that we have to have. So I thought it was the exact opposite antithesis of a bureauc bureaucratic response. And I think we found a solution that I think works <coughs> that's legal and it doesn't foreclose the idea of change the law, change the policy in the future if necessary, but this is what we have now, and I think we responded quite well. And I think our board responded quite well. And I think DEC did an extraordinary <coughs> job from Corey McGee level up to executive, with me in the middle, um, trying to deal with this issue. So I just want to set that record, set that in the record, and I want to appreciate the staff that that uh, participated in this. And I want to appreciate the public process and the comments that were made. They were constructively made, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, the Bartlett's for coming forward, Mr. Bartlett's frank, direct presentation, and, and particularly his respectfulness in bringing forward what is obviously a very emotional, uh, very personal experience. And I think that's the kind of citizen response we need to have. Uh, certainly Jerry helps us with local government, but um, we need to occasionally know what the impacts of decisions are. And, and nothing's better than that than having someone tell you about their personal experience. And so that takes a bit of courage uh, and time. And we appreciate that. Thank you, Jeff. I would like to uh, just mention the uh, Chris Novisky report yesterday. I've known Chris for a long time through Warren County, and he's a very talented, very energetic, and uh, knows how to take care of lakes. And I'm not sure the salt thing is uh, you know, a lot of other issues that enter into that of how much salt you're going to put on the roads for the safety of the public and all that, but he's trying to address a problem that sooner or later is going to cause a lot of problems, not just to Lake George, but to lakes in the park, and it would be good that his, it'd be great if his uh, efforts could be extended beyond Lake George and cover uh, the entire park, because we have, we're going to have, Art talked about it yesterday, we're going to have problems with other lakes Mirror Lake and other places in the park. I also believe that this may be the last meeting that Sarah will be sitting here beside me, and I would like to just say that I've really enjoyed the uh, relationship that she has with me and the board, and uh, 
uh, we're going to miss her here. That's what I had. Thank you, Bill. Sarah? Yeah, I don't think I'll be here next month. Um, it's been 20 months that I've been sitting here. Um, that's a long time to do two big jobs, and it hasn't been easy, um, especially as the number of staff lawyers has dropped off from seven to um, now we have three in the office. So it's been a challenging time for uh, the legal division. Um, but you guys have made, for me, this part of all of that so I don't know if I'm allowed to say the word fun, but <laughs> it's true. I so enjoy working with all of you. Um, I mean, maybe except this guy, but um, yeah. I've definitely made my share of mistakes once I voted on something, which I was not supposed to do. It just <laughs> popped out, and fortunately it didn't make it into the minutes because um, it's completely not the right process, obviously. Um, I'm sure I've made lots of other mistakes. I've never met the person who will be here um, next month. I don't think any of the staff attorneys have, so we don't have any words of wisdom for you other than we wish you and him uh, the best. And I will definitely really miss this level of engagement with all of you. Um, but I hope to see you in the future, certainly, of course, um, but maybe not every month. So thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Jerry? Thank you, Sarah. For, for working with us these past number of months. Much uh, appreciated. I would like to um, acknowledge that yesterday when Trevor Favor gave the presentation on David Nenny, the third renewal, that was his first presentation to the board, and he did a great job. So just wanted to say that. And in, by fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did get some questions there. <laughs> he did well you know, with the <laughs> questions on the third renewal and um, a project that, that hadn't changed over the years but is obviously moving forward. Um, I provided the annual report yesterday, and that was really an examination of the work that we do internally. Um, the activities that we have throughout the year and I thanked the board and the staff for their significant contributions. I also now would like to thank the engagement that we have from the public and from park stakeholders throughout and our working relationships that we have with many state agencies including those that are here with us, um, the Department of Environmental Conservation, um, Empire State Development Corporation and the Department of State. There are many other agencies at the state level that we work with that do not have the, the designee seat here at the agency. But it's through that engagement with the public, with agencies, um, with stakeholders, that there's an ongoing dialogue that takes place that's routine to the work that this agency does. And it's through that that we make better decisions in terms of our engagement, how we work, whether it be that we're looking at our private land Land or state land activities um, within the overall context of our mission to protect both the public and private lands of the Adirondack Park. So I would want to today thank everybody in this context for all that everyone does. When we look at the classification action that we did and I talked about yesterday, I mean, we're talking thousands of letters from the public. When we're looking at Hammond Pond, we're looking at the letters that are coming in, we're looking at dates when they come, we're thinking about them. That happens over and over and over again in all the work that we do. So we are very appreciative, again, of that dialogue. I was so impressed with hearing Garrett Kopp and his colleagues here today. Um, when he mentioned his work at at Clarkson with the innovation and, and entrepreneurship program and then leaving to do this business, a showcase of what can be done in the Adirondacks, locally sourced products, putting, putting the community and the work on the map. And he, he did talk about the celebration that they're gonna be having. I believe it's May 25th. There's gonna be a street event in, in Tupper Lake. Um, but we're really seeing a resurgence of activity. So those kinds of um, presentations, in addition to Chris Nowitzki and that pioneering, trying to look at a solution for a longstanding problem, I think it makes for a new mark in 2019, so. Thank you, Terry. 
I have, I think, mostly thank yous to say today. Uh, first to Corey and DEC for their Hammond Pond um, UMP, and uh, and thank you for working out and working through some some difficult situations. And hopefully, uh, this next round, people will take a look at at some of the suggestions that are in that UMP and and feel a little more comfortable about about what what um, is is trying to be attempted there. Uh, I also want to thank Dan, not only for these two presentations in these two days, but also just in general. I think that uh, the, the presenters that we have coming before us are just really interesting, thought-provoking, and I hope what we can do is, is make sure that these folks all follow up with us and keep us informed of their progress, and to the extent that there's something that we can do here at the agency to assist them, uh, we are there to do that. Uh, so, works ideas for the record. <laughs> <laughs> Good ones. <laughs> Teamwork. <laughs> Your thank you will come. Not yet, though. Uh, anyway, so Dan, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Also, uh, the 2018 annual report, the agency highlights the division reports. I thank everybody at our agency, Terry especially, I know I said this yesterday, it's a lot of work. Um, it's an it's a opportunity for us to look back and, and see the bigger picture of all the things that we did. I mean, to see all those UMPs that we did last year uh, is really something when you think about, I don't know, four or five years ago, there probably wasn't one. So it, it's, it's really amazing. Um, and I just was struck with the fact that on Hammond Pond, nothing has been done on that since 1988, and here we are doing something. So I, it, it's just very gratifying to see us move forward, to use today's technology, ideas, planning, to update these things, and hopefully in a way that, that, that is going to be uh, you know, better and, and, and um, people are going to see the improvements. And um, it's just it's very gratifying to work with you, Bob, and DC on, on, on these things. So thank you very much. Um, also, and again, Terry, thank you. So a lot of work, a lot more to do. Uh, just a comment on the SALT. I think that, that uh, yesterday and, and our FPAC meeting, all the conversations that are going on about the impact of SALT, it's not just here in the park, it's, it's statewide. They're dropping SALT everywhere. And I hope that this is the beginning that leads to a bigger conversation. And I encourage the governor, I hope, uh, will take a look at this and realize that we need to deal with this on a statewide level because that's probably what it's gonna to take to bring everybody together to, to make it happen. We, it's great what we're doing in the Adirondacks, uh, but I think it's, that has gotta be expanded statewide and, uh, and hopefully maybe from our, our, um, our position here, we can encourage that to happen in the future. Um, the other, only other thing is, uh, Sarah, Thank you. It's been a pleasure to sit next to you all these all these uh, months, and uh, I know your office is just down the road, so that's not going to down the down the hall. So that's not going to change. So we're going to continue all the good work that we're doing. But it's really been fun to sit next to you, and uh, I know I ask a lot of questions. So thank you for your patience. And finally, I just want to thank all of you again, the board, uh, for your willingness to roll up your sleeves. To, uh, to engage, to be part of these committees, to think outside the box, and to come up with new ideas of how we can do things better. Uh, there's, it's just a lot of hard work, and, and, but it, it makes it fun for me and really enjoyable to, to be here. And, uh, and I just so appreciate all the efforts. It's a great team, and it's a wonderful board, and, uh, and, and it's, it's really an honor to, to be the chair of this agency. So thank you very much. Last two things, we have uh, uh, Local Government Day, April 3rd and 4th over at uh, the Crown Plaza Hotel. Um, and then uh, next meeting, agency meeting, is April 18th and 19th. Hopefully the snow will be gone by then and uh, we'll have the golf clubs out maybe. So I wish all of you a wonderful weekend and um, we will see you next, next month. With that, I adjourn the meeting.